I don't know how it's possible, but we have yet another amazing episode of the Jonathan underscore Foster podcast fixing to come at you. Well, actually, I do know how it's possible. It's possible when you make friends with a Franciscan rock star of a scientist and professor of religion at Villanova University, and then you invite her to come on the show. That's how it's possible. So today we have my friend Ilya DeLeo on with us. Um, she's one of my very favorite authors. Arguably, I'd say, well, I don't know. We have, why do we have to argue about it? Just take my word. Arguably, I'd say my favorite book is uh, The Unbearable Wholeness of God. But honestly, I haven't read anything she's written that I don't like. So you're not going to go wrong if you start to read Ilya. I think she's a really important voice for our day and for the days to come. She has a lot to say about love and fear and artificial intelligence and science and consciousness and evolution, all super important things. And she's also a um, Tehardian. I don't know if you're familiar with the French Jesuit priest and paleontologist Tehard de Chardin. If you're not, you probably could be or should be. He's a really important thinker from the last century. And Ilya has done her work, intersects with his work a lot. So that comes up during the conversation. I don't stop the dialogue to unpack all of that. I just figured if you didn't know that and didn't know who he was, you could look him up on the Google and find out more about him. So great to have her first. Just a reminder, got to get in on your Girardi Intersections tickets if you haven't picked one up yet. It's really inexpensive. I mean, $29.99 is pretty cheap. So I hope you'll uh, grab those. Just go to eventbrite.com, search for, that's right, Girardian Intersections, and you'll find out all about that as we gather on August 19th to talk about the ways in which Rene Girard and his work intersects with the African-American experience, uh, the Bible, church, metaphysics, and other kinds of fun things. And all of that is hosted by my good friend, Dr. Thomas J. Ord. Thanks so much for listening. If you like it, you can leave a review. You know, we haven't had a really good, strong review lately. And I think surely somewhere across this great wide globe, this entire huge listenership, which, by the way, um, we've had, I think, 29 countries represented this year listening. So if I'm calculating this right, 29 out of like 195 countries total in the world, that means what, like 15% of the world's population has been listening to this podcast. Am I doing that right? I may not be doing that right. Anyhow, the point is, surely someone across this great, wide, big, beautiful earth could take some time and write a decent review. Not that there haven't been others. There have been. It's just been a while. That would be cool. That's all I ask. I want decent reviews, and then I want sharks with freaking lasers. That's it. Just those two things, and I'll be happy. All right, enough of me. Here we go with Dr. Miss Ilya DeLeo. Hi there. Ilya, how are you? I'm good, good. Yeah, my cat here is insisting on sitting on my lap, so. Well, probably because she's afraid of the waterfalls that are behind you. Behind you. <laughs> on you. Ah, uh, this is Rosie. What's up, Rosie? <laughs> it's great um, to see you. Yes, right. How's your summer going since Wyoming? Since well, I mean, since Wyoming, you know, it's probably downhill because that was such a great time. I wonder it was a, a great conference, really. Yeah, wow. and beautiful setting and all of that. But no, yeah. it's been a good summer. How about you? Are you feeling all right? Yeah, I, uh, COVID was about five days. I took the Paxlovid or whatever that is. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it seemed to like, um, it was so weird because I've had three vaccines and yeah. know, original vaccine and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I have no idea, you know, and I heard a few others got it as well. Or yeah, we started getting phone calls and texts the uh, day. Yeah, the day of uh, the day after. So about that. Yeah, well, I hope I'm now fully immune, you know, and will not get it again. I hope um, so. But it's a, have you had, because it's a crazy thing, honestly. I did, we did have it the summer of 20, gosh, two? Yeah, well, I guess yeah. a little over a year ago, yeah. Really, yeah, yeah. It's, it's very strange. It you know? is strange, yeah. Um, 
kind of a little fogginess. Um, right. I had a cough. My, my whole uh, throat was swollen and stuff like that. But well, anyway, I think we should get used to these things because these things are mutating and they're getting, they're not going away. They're just going to proliferate. <laughs> finally right. <'cause. laughs> yeah, exactly. Join the well, um, so thanks for hanging out with me today. I appreciate it. Sure. I'm a, uh, I'm a long time reader, long time listener, as it were. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, well, it's it's really nice to get to know you. Are you coming to our conference, by the way? I wish I could. Um, but mm. I can't. I cannot. No. Yeah. It's also virtual, you know. It'll be online. Oh, nice. Well, yeah. I need to. I need to check it out then. Yeah. I was. I was. Out. I was just thinking it was a, no. a physical thing. So it's online and on site. Yeah. Well, for our uh, our listeners, tell us again uh, what the date is and what that is. Uh, September 21st to the 23rd. It's on um, Whitehead and Teilhard de Chardin, Convergences and Divergences and Integration. So we have a number of Whiteheadian scholars and then some Teilhardian scholars. And I guess we'll do a comparative note taking um, <laughs> and how they complement one another and where they differ from one another, you know, which will be quite interesting. Yeah, it will be. I'll put uh, I'll put the link in the show notes and definitely oh, encourage. Great. Thank you. And um, I don't know why. Of course, it's online too. I think it just went in one part of the head and then it left, thinking because it's <laughs> fall. It's fall and it's football season for my youngest, so we're in and out of college right. games all fall. But um, I mm -hmm. will definitely. I would love that. That's right down my alley. So yeah, uh, youngest at University of yeah Colorado School of Mines out in Golden. All right. Very good. So, All right. Well, we'll get to your podcast so you can move on with your day as well. <laughs> well, this is we're already there. This is it. We're this it's happening because we're with you. This is uh, Ilya DeLeo. And um, as I like to say, what's the dealio, Ilya <laughs> Leo? <laughs> what's the deal? Um, maybe let's start with I know we've got to talk science and religion and Tehar de Chardin and all that. But yeah. maybe on a personal note, the, the COVID thing just made me think, not that your family necessarily deals with COVID, anti-vaccine, vaccine, whatever. But in general, we have a lot of listeners on the podcast and a lot of people I interact with who are just, as they try to lean into a more progressive faith, run into all kinds of problems with family mm -hmm. and close friends. How <laughs> has that been for you? Are you experiencing that as well? You you don't have to. I'm not asking you to point anyone out or anything, but just in general, are you are you finding that has that been a struggle over the years? Not just with COVID, but just as you've leaned into more expansive faith. Yes. What's, what's that journey been like for you? Uh, well, um, you know, because I grew up a very cultural Catholic in New Jersey, and we were quite traditional in that sense. And I was traditional for a number of years until I finally saw the light of Whitehead and Tayard. <laughs> Uh, but some of my family members are very, very traditional on and conservative Republican on all the issues that you name. Um, Anti-vaccines, Donald Trump um, is their savior. Um, you know, the, uh, Obama was a Muslim and, you know, we're, we're all uh, need to perfect, pr protect our manifest destiny because we're going to get taken over, you know, by the foreigners. And so uh, that has... <clears throat> I uh, and that goes hand in hand, by the way, with a kind of triumphalist uh, religion, Christianity. Uh, Jesus is savior. We're the saved. Uh, God is reign supreme. I have cat hair. <laughs> That's why I'm doing this. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, you know, um, God knows all things, and um, the righteous will be saved. Idea. And. A while in the beginning, I tried to like discuss reasonably why these ideas, it would be helpful to maybe look at them from a distance and maybe expand our understanding of things in light of culture, in light of science, in light of the fact of history changes, et cetera. Uh, but that has only, you know, driven them <laughs> to their more entrenched positions because, you know, as the saying goes, a person convinced against against their will is of the same opinion still mm -hmm. and, and so you have to want to you have to want to know in a deeper mm -hmm. way and mm -hmm. uh sometimes the um the closed bo box dogmatist you know we've got all our doctrines and our canons we've got all the answers they're right here in this box 
uh, there's there's no need to change because the box is closed. So it's like an open system, closed system. If it's not an open system, there is no uh, availability to new ideas, to new energy inputs, et cetera. So, you know, to answer your question, it has, um, I try to keep things very, very simple. <laughs> How's the weather? You know, how's your health? <laughs> uh, that, that type of thing. And so not to engage, you know, in these deeper, um, very important topics, actually, but uh, it's not possible. So yeah. um, I think you have to know, it's like Jesus said, if you enter a town and you don't find peace, shake the dust from your feet and you move on. Uh, and I thought that was very wise. You know, mm -hmm. you have to keep shaking that dust and move on because you have to say, what is most important here? Yeah. Gerard calls ideology uh, a closed system of desire. So mm. all, our, all our desires are bouncing around within this very confined space. So when you said that, that made me think of that very true. Oh, that's very interesting. Yeah. And I think that's a good term, actually, because uh, desire doesn't go away. It's just that it's yeah, bouncing around is right. Yeah, and you're um, just imitating those within your confined box. And until yeah. you realize, which I think is maybe the role of grace, somehow grace is able to work in there even still. And all of a sudden, one yes. day, you think, oh, wait, what's that tiny little hole up in the corner? Mm, yes. And suddenly you get a breath of fresh air. No, I, I do think that's true. I think I think as long as we remain rooted in God, in that openness, that expansiveness uh, that God is, there is always um, the possibility of a new horizon of life. I do think a lot of this is driven by deep existential fear. I think there's a deep, deep fear of nothingness or annihilation. And that kind of deep fear can be paralyzing. And so I find, you know, I, I kind of want to label this, and I don't like labels, but it's a kind of paralytic religious consciousness. We're paralyzed. We're, we're just kept enclosed and constrained. We're kind of prisoners of our own desires in this way. Mm -hmm. um, and I find that it's it's kind of sad because we're created for so much more. We have the capacity for so much more life, you know, but, um, you know, and this is where I think St. Peter says, you know, love drives out perfect fear. And where there's real love, you don't fear, you, you, you know, you get on that high adventure. <laughs> yeah. You go with it. Yeah, I think so, too. Sometimes uh, recently I've been thinking more and more about the existential, what you're saying, um, fear, depression, overwhelming. It's like we're the first generation, really, to actually have the knowledge, or maybe not the first, but one of the first, to have the knowledge that, like, the earth is not going to last forever. And what has that, I think that's done some really interesting stuff to us, probably, subconsciously. Yeah. I think that's really true. And and we won't last forever. So even our species, you know, is right. a species in evolution. And that's so hard for people to get around, especially religious people, the, the dogmatist type, you know, where God created us, you know, especially in the image of God. And I'm like, uh, well, <laughs> we need to rethink that one just a little bit. Yeah, we, we won't last. The earth won't last, you know, so life changes. And that's the beauty. That's the stability of life is precisely the change itself. Yeah. Um, and so I know for younger generations, the global, you know, cli climate um, crisis, uh, global warming is a serious situation and they're deeply disturbed. By, I have students who are deeply disturbed by it mm -hmm. and depression mm -hmm. therefore runs high. Do I have, you know, young people are asking me, do I have a future? Right. You know, I had a student say, I won't live beyond 30 because I don't think the earth, I don't think the earth is going to last mm -hmm. uh, in, you know, 10, 15 more years. And that's, that's alarming, actually. That is. Yeah. You know, and I, I blame my generation, my baby boomer generation, you know, for I don't want to put the onus entirely on us, but we played a large part in this alienation um, from the earth with our kind of selfishness, our individualism, our drivenness for success and power and money and status and all these things that have really have really separated us from the earth and from one another. So for sure. For sure. Yeah. Hey, question about closed and open systems, because sometimes I get confused about this. So, so the cosmos is technically an open system, right? Well, it's actually a closed system, but okay. it, it kind of operates as an open system. What's that mean? A, and I, you know, I wonder if these terms open and closed, if they're actually helpful. I think there's a midway between them, and we might call it permeably closed. 
So while boundaries exist, they are not fixed, static, and inert. In other words, they're permeable. They're subject to change. They can open up to new boundaries. So I think, um, sometimes I think when we think of open systems, it's unbounded, but it's actually a bounded system that's permeable. Um, I think boundaries are helpful because they help locate the structure of or the form of things. But the difference between open and closed is between permeable and impermeable boundaries. And I do think the the universe is um, impermeable boundaries insofar as you know cosmic life continues to change. I mean, it's this is a dynamic universe that's expanding, expanding in its yeah. unfolding, in its ongoing, you know, production of space time, and um, and yet it's wearing down. You know, I mean, there are scientists who say that in the far future that. You know, they'll be like the final thought on Earth because they'll be, you know, <laughs> the universe will have worn down to, to nothing. Crap, I thought I already had that one. <laughs> <laughs> right. The final thought. Honestly, we truth is no one really knows what the future really holds. I mean, science can make some predictions. It can make some anticipations based on some data. But data, in my view is always limited you know it's never absolute it's never the final answer that's how we have paradigm shifts so i would like to think that uh, you know from a religious perspective where there's this openness of life you know this ground of life this wholeness of life that we call god there's the infinite potential for creativity and therefore life itself so no matter what happens to this universe, maybe there'll be another universe that will right. emerge from it. Or there are other universes already in parallel, you know, parallel life with us, mm -hmm. which I think is a really neat idea. <laughs> yeah, <I do> too. <laughs> so the open and closed typically refers to energy, how energy itself can't be, there can't be new energy created. But right. so, so it, technically it's closed, but you're making the distinction with I like that perme the permeable boundaries are constantly mm -hmm. in flux. So right. it's it's kind of a, a mix of both, which is helpful. And this is why I've been confused about it, because I haven't had language like you've yes. just given me. Yeah. No, and I think I think we have to think more in terms of permeable boundaries because um, for example, I, we know in biological life that biological life complexifies, you know, in other words, right. even um self-organizing systems, you know, can uh, over time, given the right conditions, you know, uh, meet up with other systems and then form new relationships. But what if the same thing happens in the universe on a cosmic level? <clears throat> I mean, I have I have not yet seen anyone talk about cosmic comp complexification, but that would be a really kind of neat idea that this universe is actually complexifying with other universes um, and then forming something even beyond our wild imagination, you know, in terms of wholeness. I like it. My mind is, my brain is spinning here. So <laughs> I know you get that a lot. Sorry, were you going to say something? No, no, no. So the open and closed, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, um, the way they are defined is that a closed system is a bounded system in which um, the, the amount of energy put into that system uh, allows for the work done in the system. But once the energy is used up, unless there's new energy put in to the system, the system will wear down. Whereas a an open system has a system that's always open to the environment, which means it's constantly being affected by the wider environment. So energy doesn't really wear down in the same way. In fact, open systems are the basis of complexity. In other words, systems not only wear down, they build up. <laughs> hmm. So what is an open, what's an example of an open system? Well, I think most of biological life in terms of um, organic life, in terms of, say, um, cellular life. Uh, I think the formation of the human body from simple cellular life to multicellular to, you know, blastocyst and then eventually to organs and then organs, you know, begin to align um, with other organs and they start forming bodies of some sort. And so I do think you could probably find some, you know, explicit examples um, within the formation of the vertebrae, formation of the brain. Um, I think these are type, you know, these are systems that could be defined as open insofar as they develop in a way that um, they complexify over time and begin to form greater wholeness. Yeah. Yeah. So you're talking about evolution. I am. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tell That's me. Yeah. I was uh, 
so my my next little book project, I'm gonna I'm gonna crowdfund it. And oh. um, so I was on Indiegogo, the the uh, crowdfunding site recently. I was mm-hmm. really I was really surprised to find I was just perusing some of the offerings there. And one of the huh. books recently that has overfunded by by a lot is a whole series of books on refuting evolution. And, you know, it's it's mm-hmm. it's written. I, I didn't I haven't read it yet, but you can tell just by the presentation, it's done very well. The uh, huh. the packaging is done well and it's raised like three or four times more. So I was surprised, obviously disappointed, uh, bummed about all that. But it's hmm. still a really real thing. So what does what does Ilya love about the concept of evolution and God in all of this? Yeah. Well, let me just ask, what do they propose in place of evolution for the development of life? I didn't read it, but I'm a, I'm assuming it was God finger snapping. Mm. And it's an omnipotent kind of, I'm assuming that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. So that's really interesting. So I would begin the, the discussion of evolution Um not with biology, but with quantum physics. So I think we have to begin with what reality is is itself. And I think quantum physics is one of the best descriptions of reality today. And therefore, I think what we're understanding from quantum, the quantum world, is that matter is not not an inner something. It doesn't just appear. I mean, matter is a form of energy. And I think that's one thing that we really ha- we can't quite get our heads around. There's, you know, we're out of the world of Aristotle <laughs> and Plato, for that matter. But Plato might have a little bit more usage here. Um, but matter is really uh, this is, you know, Einstein's theory of special relativity. Matter and energy are interconvertible. In other words, again, if you take like anything, any form of matter, and you uh, raise the temperature of a, of a drop of water, you get a vapor. It's the same mass. It's actually the same mass. <clears throat> it's the same constituency, but it's on a different level of energy. Um, and if you lower that temperature and you get ice, it's the same stuff, but on a different level, a lower level of energy. And so you have three forms of matter with the same mass. Each, you know, in other words, the mass hasn't changed. So, so what we're saying here is that matter and energy are two forms of the same reality. And beginning with that, um, you know, and that's why to, to be to dispute evolution based on biology alone is actually a false start. It, you're not going to go anywhere with that. I mean, it just leads to dead ends. Um, because once we begin to understand matter as a form of energy, and then we say, well, how do we know where anything is, and this energy is really just um, relationships. And that's really what, I mean, if you look at matter from a quantum perspective, it's just all a bunch of mathematical formulas from a human, you know, a human description of it, because we can't really say what matter is. Um, all we can do is kind of observe, you know, something, and then we can describe it on the quantum level in terms of mathematical relationships. And so the thing is, we don't know the inside of matter apart from our ability, our minds, or our observation to make a determination of something. So that has led to the, you know, um, the rise of panpsychism, or the fact that you cannot detach mind from matter. (laughs) And so we, you know, even these kind of discussions on what matter is, you know, as if the mind is something outside it, makes no sense. And so we begin with the fact that mind and matter are, are two two aspects of the one reality. This is the work of David Bohm, Teilhard de Chardin picks up on this. In our own time, Philip Goff, the philosopher, has written quite a lot. Um, um, Robert Lanza, Urban Laszlo, a lot of people have. Um, and then Galen Strassen, the philosopher from Texas, you know, wrote a really enticing article a few years ago said saying consciousness isn't the mystery, matter is the mystery. In other words, you can't, we don't know what matter is apart from consciousness. So matter is actually what's most mysterious. So beginning with that, and that's actually where Teilhard de Chardin begins his understanding of um, the whole. Uh, He's not a quantum physicist by any means, but he's very attentive to what the new physics is saying. And that's why he says, no matter how much you trace it down, you know, like here we are, we're thinking beings. We trace it, uh, trace, you know, we try to trace ourselves to the to the beginning root of what we are, and you know we can't 
we can't extricate our minds from it. And it's just the whole of the mind of what we are with, you know, what we um, can observe or what science can tells us, tells us. So evolution, therefore, becomes, it's not just Darwinian, you know, nat well, all the, not to dispute Darwin's mechanisms of natural selection, um, you know, and adaptation and these type of things, but that's not the whole of evolution. Evolution, I think, ne really needs to take into account quantum biology, which means taking into account um, the fact that matter is relationality, you know, which is something Whitehead himself really uh, honed in on. And therefore, um, it's the kind of the mystery of matter that relationships are constantly dynamic and 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 in sort in, in being lured to more relationships. <laughs> and so evolution is the unfolding of life, you know, the evolvery, like a scroll, you know, all wrapped up, and then you begin to unfold the scroll. And that's what life is. It's the unfolding of the scroll. And I think that's very consonant with scripture. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think. You know, God was like, ta-da, you know, here we are, it's all fixed. It scripture, Genesis, is about relationship, right? God, you know, is we become we become aware of this one, this transcendent, you know, one, this being who's in relationship. And the whole thing is about relationship. God is constantly running after everyone in the Old Testament who, you know, ditched him and stuff. And then the whole New Testament, I mean, Jesus of Nazareth is all about relationship. The Father and I are one, you know, no one knows about blah, 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 blah. So uh, relationship is the key. And I think evolution is about relationality toward more life. That's how basically I would, you know, describe That's it. Nice. You, you wrote somewhere, um, I quoted you, well, I try to quote you as often as I can. It just, oh. it, it, it bodes well for me when I do. Um, but you wrote somewhere that Christianity is not a flight from, um, from, from the, the world. world. Yeah. Christianity is not a flight from the world. It's a flight from separateness. Yes, but, exactly. But what I'm hearing you say, I'm reminded when you just, you had that little tangent about uh, the person in Texas who wrote the article, Science also gets this messed up too, right? Religion and science both absolutely. kind of wind up playing the same game. Yeah, absolutely. Science, I think it's the fallacy of misplaced concreteness, to mm -hmm. use the white heading term, you know, that science thinks that this is the self-sufficient answer to all our searchings. And clearly, this is something that Teilhard really astutely, and, and I'm actually working on this this summer because I think for too long, we have kept science and religion as these two separate disciplines or two entities that somehow need to find their way to one another. What Taylor begins to realize, his whole hermeneutic is the whole, the whole. No matter how far you trace something down, you cannot get away from the whole. Even a small atom, you know, is uh, even a particle is a whole. Um, the whole, because we, we can only tell that a particle exists because we're observing it because we humans have this mind that's already part of that whole. And so, you know, um, what Taylor begins to realize is that religion is a natural part of evolution. In other words, if mind and matter are two dimensions of the one reality, so we could say mind is the inside of matter, matter is the outside of mind, matter is the attractability, um, the attractability of matter is the outside, and the um, kind of depth and transcendence is the inside. Um, even uh, even you know um, small particles like why are they attracted to one another? You know what is that basis of attraction? Brian Swim once said we know a lot about quantum physics. We can't tell you why there is this fundamental law of attraction in the universe. That's a really fascinating statement. Mm -hmm. um, and so you know this this kind of attractability. Um, that, you know, underlies even consciousness. I think that word itself, I don't think there's a thing of consciousness. Consciousness is more like the field of relation relationship in which information is flowing. Um, and so all of these things um, are telling us that, um, you know, evolution is is not what we think it is, and religion and science are not what we think they are. I think we've been really misguided. And I think what if we were to think about every aspect of nature has a religious dimension. In other words, it has um, aspects of relationality, cooperativity, uh, transcendence, these type of things. And only when that religious 
um, nature of nature becomes into human consciousness where we have symbolic language, we have, you know, higher levels of thought and self-reflection, that religion now becomes focused on a on transcendent uh, deity and then we've developed rituals and everything. And what Teilhard is saying is that we don't understand that religion and science are two aspects of knowing the one whole. We will always be fractured and we will be continuously alienated from one another and from the earth. And I think that's incredibly, uh, honestly, I had not seen anyone develop that in Teilhard's writings, but I think it's an incredibly novel insight that people miss and he keeps saying there's only one thing that's in one hole that's in evolution and that hole includes god it's yeah. not god and evolution or religion and science so we have to get rid of all conjunctions <laughs> in a world of quantum reality that's so that's so cool and that reminds me of whitehead too the dipolar of his thinking yes there is a lot of similarity between Whitehead and Teilhard, for sure. Um, I think, you know, the differences are White, uh, Whitehead is much more the philosopher and writing against, uh, I think, the Enlightenment. And Teilhard is the science of the geologist, in a sense, if anything, writing against a stale Christianity or, you mm -hmm. know, a Catholic church that is too inward looking and apathetic. Mm -hmm. um, but imagine, imagine that. <laughs> yeah, imagine that is right. <laughs> what else is new? Um, so anyway, very now, exciting. Well, and some of uh, some of what you're talking about too, like just saying the word religion, it's such a hard word to define. So obviously, for those listening, you know, you could double click on that and spend a lot of time. You know, in, in my background with Gerard, religion is is basically a pejorative, it's almost a pejorative term, really. Yes, I understand. Fully. So it just requires in this permeable, permeated boundaries system that we live in, it requires some folks to kind of move the boundaries around and learn some new language. And Yes, no, I definitely agree, Jonathan. I think religion carries a lot of baggage, like you mm -hmm. say, you know, and it's got, got a long history and sometimes a really bad one. I mean, it's been responsible for a lot of violence and colonization and, you know, alienation. But on the other hand, and I think that's just bad, I think there's bad religion and there's good religion. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of bad religion is really unhelpful and you want to really get rid of it. Yeah. But um, I think reclaiming religion in its root reality, in other words, what it really is that religio, that what is the ligament? Yeah. What binds us, you know, what gets you up in the morning type thing, um, which means that there's no atheism. There's or, or or maybe it's all atheism because in a sense, it's all theism, you know, and that's the whole thing of religion. If all of if all of nature is religious by its very nature of existing. Trees are religious, flowers are religious, the sky is religious. Um, and that religion is just living out of that inherent beauty and relationality and the goodness that it is. You know, and then yeah. religion, it's a bum rap when it comes to humans. I mean, it just gets worse as it goes up the scale. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I really like that. That's that's super helpful. The connectedness piece of it, whether you call yourself a Catholic or a Protestant or a Muslim or a Jew or, a or anything, or yeah. anything. It doesn't, it, it's the connected piece and it's the piece that the science often misses. And it's the piece that the religious quote unquote religious person often misses. Yeah. Yes. I, I fully agree. I think science is too focused on mechanisms, um, you know, trying to describe mechanisms of action to understand how things work. And that is very, very helpful, but that's not the entire story. There are other aspects here that go with that story that enhance the whole of what that entity right. is. And to be clear, I'm not trying to be uh, not trying to denigrate the scientists because a lot of them I'm using scientists like like an yes. overarching term. But yeah. a lot of, uh, let's say, atheist scientists are are probably responding maybe with more honesty and integrity, maybe than some of the religious people, because they're responding to this silly idea of this non-separate god in the first place but then yes. it feels like once they get into it they kind of get stuck into it so no i i, I think actually i read a paper this summer on uh Desjardins and the love of matter 
and he speaks about dark adoration, science as doing as dark uh, scientists as doing dark adoration. Mm. In other words, and and I kind of take that hand in hand with a book I'm reading by Jack, my colleague John Caputo, on what is radical theology, and I think you know basically what uh, Teilhard and Jack Caputo are saying is, you know, bad theology has really, and and I fully agree with the scientists. There is no superhuman being, you know, there's no like father figure uh, who's up there like Zeus or like the Wizard of Oz looking over us. I mean, that that is so unhelpful. And it's so not what religion is. And it's really not even what the Judeo-Christian tradition is at right. all. Right. Um, so, you know, Caputo <laughs> speaks about bridge builders who want to build this ladder to heaven, you know, and climb up from earth to heaven. And where this, you know, supreme heavenly, as, you know, Tom Ward has written so much about this omniscient, omnipotent God lives. And, and that's just a figment of our imagination. We're hoping that there's something else out there, but the out there is here. That's the whole point. And so there's gr what he calls ground diggers, those who really go within, really take time. And that's everything. The ground digger is everything from, you know, just spending time in nature, like being with the beauty of the water um, or just being astounded, you know, by the creativity of an artist or a musician, the awesomeness of it because that's where divinity dwells, you know, divinity is that ground, that incredible fecundity that is, you know, in a sense, the energy and uh, providing the energy of all life. And so I think science is scientists are deeply spiritual people, whether yeah. or not they would ever claim that for themselves, right. but they are driven by a love of matter. They're, mm -hmm. they're driven by it. I mean, I was a scientist, so I, I really do know right. that what gets up people up in the morning and, you know, you know, not just writing grants all the time, but thinking about mechanisms and why this cell is operating this way or this protein. There's a there's a there's a spirituality there of sure. matter that sure. clearly is um, it's its own religious nature. <laughs> so right. Right. Um, so it, I don't think there's a, I don't think there's anything such as atheism. I think atheism emerged in modernity in reaction to that sky and the guy God, you know, the sky yeah. God. Right. Which I definitely agree with. In know, that so. case, in that case, I'm an atheist. Yeah, Help healthy atheism, right? <laughs> healthy right. atheism is actually good theism. I mean, if we understand yeah. that, if I we agree. understand what God is about. Uh, speaking of John Caputo, uh, I couldn't help but notice, Ilya, that he has accepted my Facebook friend request, but you have not. Oh, <laughs> so. <laughs> So if it would round out my 2023 year if we could just make oh, that happen. Definitely. Just sometime. I know you're busy. You got other things to do, busy. but yeah, just, no, you know. <laughs> happy to do that. Yeah. Let's change subjects. Can I got to ask you about artificial intelligence? Yes. With respect to AI, what are you concerned about that no one else seems concerned about? And closely mm. closely related what are you not concerned about that everyone else seems to be concerned about? Well, I think I'm concerned. Um, uh, I am concerned actually at our deep fear of AI, mm. which actually is a, a naivete with regard to what AI is. But that kind of deep fear causes us to withdraw from AI and, and not want to engage it, which actually opens up um, the pathways for mega corporations who are building AI and the chips to, to kind of determine our future. And so I am deeply concerned about mega corporations determining our future of AI and AI driven life without our input. Um, I actually, I'm a, actually a proponent of AI. I think it's pretty fantastic that, you know, first of all, it's not just what we have created, it's the capacity of nature and its informational, you know, uh, matrix to be harnessed and then extended in a way that we can now extend the mind and enhance ourselves biomedically and stuff like this. So AI has tremendous potential, I think, to enhance life. But I do think we cannot allow AI development to be purely a corporate um, corporate development. In other words, this is not about big business alone. Um, we need philosophers, theologians, ethicists um, at the table of you know who's who's making this stuff. 
Uh, I, I think I think we need public policies around the, the uh, use and development of AI. It can't be just this unbridled, you know, if NVIDIA makes the, the best super chip, it should just go ahead and make trillions of dollars doing this. Or, you know, if Microsoft invents, you know, the latest chat GPT-5, you know, we should just, and we're so, uh, I'm just shocked sometimes the way we're, we just like are voiceless with regard to artificial intelligence, but, they create this stuff, we go out and buy it because we feel we need it to, to yeah. function okay. So that's my one fear. My second fear is a global shutdown uh, mm. due to an AI virus. So we went through COVID um, and that you know pretty much shut down the world for a little bit. But I deeply fear um, the malevolence, you know, a, 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 a bad use of computer viruses to instigate uh, a type of global terrorism or a global shutdown. And that's that there's a real possibility there, you know. Um, and that's what happens if we are not actively engaged religiously, culturally, scientifically, philosophically, theologically in the discussions of AI. We are really opening ourselves and making ourselves more vulnerable to a type of, you know, um, a potential terrorist attack of AI. Um, and just this kind of unbridled development of it that gives us a very blind future. Mm -hmm. It makes us very vulnerable in the in the face of what we what we can become with just runaway AI, which is kind of the Frankenstein. You know, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein was really based on that whole idea. Like, mm -hmm. look what can become of us. You know, gross, grotesque creatures. Um, can we build robots that will supplant humans? Um, I don't think so. You know, I, I think the scientific things, you know, like Ex Machina and those those movies that want to portray the fact that we can create humanoids that will mimic humans that can eventually maybe replace humans. That also is a deep fear right now among us that we are going to be um, replaced by robots. Well, we will to some extent, definitely in the workforce. Um, you know, unfortunately, people with certain jobs, uh, truck drivers, receptionists, maybe in you know, dental hygienists, anything that has a mechanical aspect to it will be easily replaced by robots in the, in the not too distant future. That's definitely gonna shape, reshape the job market. Um, and that creates problems economically because if the people who have those jobs are not trained or educated for other tasks that can benefit an AI world, they're left out of the loop. So another problem with AI is widening the gap between the rich and the poor because um, AI is an extreme an extreme body of wealth right now uh, for those who are investing in it and developing it, um, but it's really to the exclusion of um, the rest of everyone yeah, else. For sure. Um, yeah, so, I heard someone recently call it the, uh, the trillion dollar question as it's being it answered. Is. Someone will make a trillion dollars and probably maybe more. Yeah, so. I mean, NVIDIA Corporation, mm -hmm. you know, the stock has shot up over the last six months, like incredibly, like uh, I would say two, three folds. And uh, it's a, it's a trillion, it's, if it's not a trillion dollar company, it, it's soon on its way to be. And so is Apple Corporation, you know? Right, right. Um, and there's something deeply, deeply wrong with this, you know, with this yeah. consolidation of massive wealth yeah. um, in companies, in large mega corporations. And, and these corporations are basically determining our future. They're running the show. And therefore, I think our apparent freedom that we have is really not so free. We're really beholden to these things. And so um, we have to find a way. This is where I would like to see more theologians and philosophers really get actively engaged in these discussions. And maybe we should do so politically um, in terms of public policy as well. We're a little bit too reticent here. And we can't keep it all on the academic level either. We have to know the way um, the way uh, artificial intelligence, computer technology is really changing, not only the workforce, but, you know, corporate, corporate mentality and, you know, corporate decisions. So, yeah, we're facing, a, again, it's, um, we're at a press, we're, we're at a, we're at a point, an axial point, I think, with regard to technology. Um, and we tend to want to, like everything else, we want to stay safe. You know, we want to stay in our own little backyards and not get too involved, but keep a close eye on it. And I'm like, hey, you want to really get involved. You want to really know what it's about. Yeah. Yeah. So you identified some things that you kind of started to go in the direction of what you don't fear. 
But what else, what what do you love about AI? Yeah, you did say that. What do you love about AI? I do. Uh, well, um, first of all, you know, Teilhard had a whole um, theology built around the new sphere, what he called the new sphere or the level of mind. So he sees that evolution uh, is, a, is a progression. And it's not so much a progression. It's actually a complexification. So people often get this wrong about him. They keep thinking that he's this naive optimist and all thing, everything's getting better. That's not what it's getting. It's getting complexified. In other words, mm-hmm that drivenness of consciousness and materiality is towards greater complexity. And so the new sphere is the higher level of mind or greater complexified thought, uh, which he saw was the next outcome and certainly being enhanced now by uh, the, you know, the advent of the computer. He didn't live to see the internet age, but he certainly predicted it. Um, Now in his view, because, and here's what's really interesting. Artificial intelligence, what we tend to do is we narrow it down to this thing called artificial intelligence or computer technology, and now we have to deal with it. Um, Teilhard put it within the whole flow of evolution, and that's what we have yet to do. We don't see how does artificial intelligence, um, what's its role in the larger scope of evolution, which means that because we're on a trend of complexifying consciousness, something like this was bound to occur anyway if you if you go back to the beginning of things you know when we were like little baby bacteria you know i mean what how did we get to this point of you know life and so what taylor is saying is there's something uh, a process going on here in which artificial intelligence is in a sense the most logical next step in the whole development of the new sphere but he says how we use it and develop it uh, will make a difference. And he says it can't be about just increasing thought alone. He thought artificial intelligence must lead to greater convergence and that must lead to a greater sense of love and compassion. In other words, are we just ab- all about more information and more thought or are we developing a greater, you might say, a greater world soul or a greater heart together? Mm-hmm. And that's the part we haven't done. You know, we, I think uh, artificial intelligence has been this rapid influx of development almost at a breathless speed. And we have barely kept up with it because this is only in the last, we're talking like 30, 40 years, you know, that has radically changed our world and our lives. And so we're like, you know, like, oh my God, chat GPT-4. Oh no, the robots are, they're going to think for us. What's going to happen to us? We're going to lose the human mind. Well, you might if you you take that stance, but we have to say, what does this mean for us in the overall flow of evolution? Where are we going with it? That's the whole point. And we don't have, if we keep denying evolution, we will have more and more problems with artificial intelligence. Um, the, the more we want a, you know, uh, a dualistic world with a God who's hovering over it and will take care of everything, the more we are alienating ourselves from the creativity of life itself and, um, in a sense, the evolution of thought. And instead of being part of it and therefore shapers of the future, we will be more and more shriveled and withdrawn from that future, uh, fearful and therefore more violent. Um, it will just resound, you know, into greater violence. So I think the question of, you know, what, what makes us fearful and what makes us hopeful needs to be more adequately engaged on an ongoing basis because uh, the hope needs to trump, you know, triumph over the fear. And we have to begin to see that this is what nature is about, not just what we're about. Nature is techne. Nature will always find tools to optimize life toward greater life. And now we know more from science about consciousness and complexity. We can speak more to what that more life means for us. And we can use technology to really build a better world, a better planet. Um, I really think we have the capacity to do that. But we need a lot of other factors on board for that to happen. Yeah, one of the many things I thought of as you were talking there was the the concept, the idea of agency popped into my mind um, because it We've, you've hit that same theme a couple of times of we, we start as a species and as individuals at times, we start to uh, shrink back because it's so, it can be so overwhelming. Um, so um, this whole agency piece and autonomy and how much love really 
really wants to build us up and see what we can do and not just control it and exactly there's something really um what's attractive about you is you you have this really great obviously gift of science and religion and you know uh, all of that but um you you do have a sense of agency about you where did that come from and how has love helped you uh, facilitate that and grow yeah. that that's a good question um i i think you know, once I began to realize that God is not out there, but God is here within, you know, in that power of love that sustains my life, um, I guess I found a new level of freedom in that. Mm. Um, I didn't have to worry so much whether I was going to be pleasing to God or not. It's like God's okay, you know, with <laughs> things as we go. And um, I think out of the freedom to be, uh, and then, of course, you know, reflecting more on Teilhard and, and Whitehead, and the notion of creativity, which I think is so important, Whitehead's ultimate principle of creativity, that uh, we are co-creative, we are co-creative agents where, you know, God will never do anything, or this God that we think is hovering about or taking care of everything. That's just, that's just silly, quite honestly. I mean, the whole point of God is like, um, even the Benedictus, I have come to my people and set them free. It's in the freedom to be that we become something in and with God, you know, in, in a in a more in a way that's more uh, life giving. And so, I've given up a lot of worry about whether this is going to be good for God or not. You know, not good or you know, am I going to get judged or not? And that's just like I like living the moment. You know, mm -hmm. it's just taking a moment of engagement. Mm -hmm. And it's taking and being mindful, being thoughtful mm -hmm. of where we are, you know, what we're attentive to, who we're, who we're speaking about, uh, to, what are we speaking about? How do we just see the goodness of everything, every person we meet, you know, every just looking at the sky and the trees and even the rain and just taking what is in this moment and engaging it in what we're becoming. You know, it's a, it's a process, not only of being, but of becoming. And that's a that kind of becoming, I think, is what love is about. Love is always being drawn to to the more, to to the more unitive life, to the other, um, to the sense of the whole that we all long for. And I, I do believe that there is a power of love, an irresistible power of love that sustains all our lives. And I think every single person, when you come down to it, I think, you know, I think Mother Teresa of Calcutta said this, you know, every single person, no matter who they are, what they believe, what they don't believe, what color, what race, what, you know, language, et cetera, every person wants to love and to be loved. It's our fundamental core um, energy of life. Mm -hmm. And if we lived only in that energy, I think the rest of life would, would really fall into a new center for us. Even it's, you know, think people hurt people. We do terrible things. We say terrible things to one another. It's not so much that, you know, these things happen. They do happen and they're hurtful, et cetera. But you have to let go. You know, you let go. And then because you can never redo the past. You know, I think a lot of people live with a lot of past relics. You know, they're living with a lot of dead shells. And the only thing we have is this moment as it's opening up to the future. And so every moment is a decision. And that's why we are agents. Um, we must be conscious of being engaged. Um, if we allow our minds to get cut off and locked into past events, we're always living one step behind. And so the rest of life is moving on and we're like trying to fix whatever happened. It's over. And that's okay. I mean, a lot of evolution <laughs> went through a lot of dead ends and mm -hmm. a lot of violence and everything. I think our greatest reality is the future and our and our movement into the future is empowered by love. And I think we have to trust that future and trust our capacity to help shape that future into something life-giving and good and wholesome for the planet and for our lives. Nice. Very nice. Very well put made me think of i remember the first time i said uh from the from the platform at our little faith community uh which existed inside of a a bigger uh you know religious faith community but i remember the first time i said i don't i don't fear god which was completely opposite of anything i would have ever said or was conditioned to say and right. even as it was coming out of my mouth i thought wait is that true and then i thought yeah i actually don't fear god and uh i, I just remember the take that some of the people had and then of course eventually what the entire 
bigger religious system had was, yeah. oh, no, well, if you don't fear God, you better fear us. And so yeah. someone's got to be feared. So I I resonate so much with what you're saying. And, and I hope listeners, hope it's not lost on whoever's listening that we're talking about AI and fear and love all in the same breath. They're not separate things. They're all intervolved. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, exactly. And I think I think God would be, I mean, you know, again, I think we have to see this is what Teilhard realized that, that God is emerging. You know, as if AI can help bring us to a more uh collective or convergent thought, you know, where we begin to see the whole together, God can emerge in that. We begin to see something that's more than ourselves at the heart of ourselves, you know. And that's the whole thing is, you know, the only fear you should have is like. The fear of, of, of not loving enough, <laughs> yeah, right. you know, the fear of not forgiving enough, the fear of not letting go enough, um, the fear of not just living in this in, in the now. Yeah. So I think, you know, I think God is perfectly at home in in all our weakness. And, it, you know, I think God's like, well, whatever, you know, just keep going. <laughs> There is a story that I always think about from I think it was Cardinal Basil Hume in, in England. And when he was growing up, there was a cookie jar. And his mother would say, now, don't eat from that cookie jar, you know, um, on Sundays. And, you know, every Sunday he would pass the cookie jar and be tempted to, like, put his. And then he had this fear of God, like, if he ate from the cookie jar, God would punish him, you know, and he would go to hell if he died. <laughs> so one Sunday... He said, oh, I'm just going to try getting a cookie out of that cookie jar. So he opens up the cookie jar and he eats the cookie. He says, and, and he hears God say, wasn't that good? <laughs> <You know? laughs> and that's the type of thing, right? You know, the fear is our fear, not God. Yeah, that's right. Just superimpose that story over everything you're going through in life and you're going to be okay. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, it's so cool to connect with you. Um, I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you, your um and I'll, I'll mention some of your books there's too many to mention um <laughs> but i'll throw some of them in the show notes and um a lot of them have really benefited me but i know you've been working recently on carl young stuff and Teilhard. yes i have a book coming out uh at end of august early september called okay. the not yet god okay uh it's on carl young tear Desjardins, and the relational fold uh and so i um, I really try to engage, you know, this um, question of God in light of what we now know from quantum physics um, mm. and evolution, um, because I do think science is our best source of knowledge for reality, but then we do need philosophical reflection on that reality to, in a sense, engage a robust theology for our times, and that's basically the way I try to do things. So. Uh, this definitely will be a challenge for some. Carl Jung had some very novel ideas on Christianity, mm. but I think that I think he's on the right track. I think we have unfortunately created a religion that is neither true to what the New Testament is about, um, and certainly has at some point metaphysically alienated us from um, the natural world, and so. Christianity is not the problem. It's the way it's been interpreted mm -hmm. and constructed um, mm -hmm. over the years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I well, try to I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to that book. I will read it. It'll be fun. Great. Well, I've taken enough of your time. Thanks so much oh. for hanging out with me. It was great to get to know you this summer, and hopefully we'll get to do more stuff together. Likewise, and I wish you uh, many blessings in your work. Thank you. Work for the universe and all of life. Take you care. too. Okay. All right, Elia. Take care. God bless. You too, Jonathan. Bye.